a muddy trail. But it's actually remarkably well formed. Why? Because this once was a railway track. Or more correctly, a tramway track. But soon, it's going to be something quite different. The new timber trail will be an 85 kilometre cycle and walking track through the Poriora Forest Park in one of the least known parts of New Zealand. Which is amazing, really, for the park is so close to the very well-known Lake Taupo. But the King Country, to the west of Lake Taupo, is one of the hidden secrets of New Zealand. It's a landscape of quiet country, sweeping views of mountain ridges, with farmland carved out by pioneers from the bush. Remote from the urban world, it's a magical escape from modernity. And, of course, it was the bush that attracted the sawmillers. After the First World War, Ellis and Bernand were one of the most important sawmilling concerns in the country. The product of the mill went out by rail. But the logs came in by rail too. They were loaded onto log bogies out in the bush. Then they were carried on a tramway through the bush. But here, the tramway was not as rough as some forest operations. The Ellis and Burnand Tramway was the only tramway in New Zealand to be built to the full 3 foot 6 inch gauge of the National Railway System. And it was engineered to very high standards. There were expensive earthworks, like these cuttings through volcanic pumice. And here, the track formation had to be hacked out of steep, rocky bluffs. There was even a spiral, with a curved tunnel 60 metres long. Near the tunnel, the most famous photograph of the tramway was taken, with the two Price 16-wheeler locos posed on the bridges where the spiral crossed over itself. Some of the viaducts were very elaborate. This one, over the Mangatukutuku stream, was 27 metres high and very nearly 100 metres along its curved deck. But well built as it was, the line was always vulnerable to the weather. Serious flooding in 1925 washed out whole sections of the line. But the worst flooding came in 1958. The stream that ran around the spiral broke its banks and flowed through the tunnel, tearing out the rails in the cutting below. These slips and washouts doomed the line, because with only a limited amount of timber left to cut, it simply wasn't worth the expense of repairing the tramway yet again. Trucks supplied the mill for a few more years, but in 1966, Ellis and Bernand operations based on Ongarui ceased, and the mill was demolished. By 2011, 
The only recognisable remnants of rail on the tramway were at the head of the tunnel, where another stream had broken its banks and created a waterfall right at the tunnel mouth. Fifty years of water flowing through the tunnel had lowered the floor, causing several of the roof supports to collapse. And fifty years of neglect had allowed much of the tramway to be completely overgrown with scrub, to the point where you could hardly see it as a tramway at all. One of the first tasks towards creating the new cycleway was to clear this vegetation away. Here is all that's left of the upper spiral bridge. And here, all that's left of the lower. Most bridges and many drainage culverts had gone altogether, rotted away, or actually demolished for safety. Where the scrub hadn't grown, mostly through well-covered bush, mud and debris had accumulated. Especially in the cuttings, where drainage ditches and culverts had long ceased to work properly. But the 40 kilometres or so of the old Ellis and Burnand tramway system was what inspired the idea of the new cycleway. The remaining 45 kilometres or so will be formed on other logging routes and on new tracks made through the native bush of the Puriora Forest Park. Finding the best route for new track involves bush bashing. For many Kiwis, a favourite pastime. An experienced contractor with a deep love for the bush was employed. He's forging his way through growth where he can't see very far in front or behind him. So he's marking his trail carefully with strips of flagging tape and with today's high-tech GPS. Once the overall route has been agreed, these markers will be used by the track building crew. Mini diggers are ideal for the job. One man and an assistant able to do what used to take several men days and weeks to achieve. But ahead of them, tangled bush and the bigger trees must be cleared. The Department of Conservation's job is to conserve the natural environment, but it's also to help people to enjoy it. Clearly, making new track has an impact, but it will allow many more people to experience new areas 
of native bush. Before work can start on securing the tunnel, that stream must be rerouted into a diversion channel. Before the stream goes, dock field staff search the watercourse in the cutting below the tunnel for aquatic life. Bags begin the job. Later, the digger will form an earth dam. With time running out, the search moves into the tunnel itself. What they're looking for are eels and cholera, or native freshwater crayfish. Much of the landscape that the trail will pass through is soft pumice, vulnerable to scouring. Hundreds of cubic metres of rock fill have been put down to prevent just that. Controlling water damage is one of the main tasks on both the old formation and the new track. To this end, hundreds of culverts are being installed. The new diversion is now in full flow and work has begun on the major bridges. Some of these will be feats of engineering in their own right. This is the lower spiral bridge over the diversion channel. Meanwhile, with the stream no longer flowing through the tunnel, work can begin on making it safe. The worry is loose rock falling out of the roof.
scaling down knocked some obvious stuff off. But to be absolutely sure, the flaky parts of the tunnel will be rock bolted and wire mesh fixed to the bolts. The new lower spiral bridge is next to the old. The main beams across the span were laminated in the contractor's factory in Levin. They are 14 metres long. Another water problem. The diversion for the waterfall at the head of the tunnel has begun to flow into the cutting below the upper spiral bridge. This will be fixed before the trail is opened. The upper bridge also has laminated main beams, 14 metres long. The track here will be 15 metres above the track below. It's a sure bet that the two bridges will be a popular photo stop. So too will be the Mangatukatuku viaduct, for quite a different reason. This suspension bridge replaces the spectacular curved wooden viaduct of old. Sadly, Cost ruled out building a replica of the original. Even though the new bridge will not be the longest on the new trail, the Mangatukatuku should be spectacular enough for most people. It will be 88 metres long and 30 metres above the riverbed below. You'd think it would have been spectacular for the crew that built it, working seemingly in mid-air, on a swaying platform. But then, for these guys, it's just another day at the office. No photocopiers here, or emails, or inter-office memos. And what a day. Closing the gap. From now on, they won't have to climb down and ford the river to get to work on the other side. The guys in the tunnel aren't quite so lucky. Wire meshing the whole roof was a late call by the engineers. 
the more the rock drillers worked, the more fragile the roof of the tunnel seemed. So the decision was made to wire mesh the lot. The rock bolts were fixed into their holes first with epoxy superglue and then grouted with a fine cement mix later. The cutting below the tunnel looks quite different now. The tunnel isn't the only place where there's a danger of falling rocks. On part of the trail, some rocks have fallen off onto the tram and others are being dislodged by a specialist abseiling crew. Some are pretty hefty. Better they are down now rather than later. Getting rid of them won't be a problem. One of the last major projects on the Timber Trail was the construction of its longest bridge. This is one of the four towers that will hold up the suspension cables. It's 12 metres high. The ground crew's job is to bolt it to the foundation as quickly as possible. Each tower comes with half the timber bracing strapped to the main beam to stop it moving about during transit. All up, each lift weighs about 1.2 tonnes. The dark lines you can see across the top of the towers are actually saddles designed to seat the cables. the fourth and final tower. The far side of the Maramataha stream is closely covered with trees. Doc has a policy of cutting the minimum bush during its works. And this is going to cause some difficulties for the pilot.
Work starts immediately on bracing up the towers and on getting ready for the next stage. Steel rods, called hangers or droppers, will support the decking below the suspension cables. Some will be fitted once the cables are in place. But some are fixed to the cables on the ground, to be flown in with the cables. And this is the bit that the helicopter pilot is really not looking forward to. Lifting the cables with those hangers already attached. The reason is that the bridge cables themselves are 205 metres long. Add to that the lift wire below the helicopter and the bottom wire plus the strop for the ground crew to catch and the total length is about 250 metres. The pilot will barely be able to see the bottom he will have to rely totally on direction from the ground crew below. With one end of the cable fixed to its anchor point, the pilot has to fly backwards across the gorge, pulling the cable behind him. At a little over a ton, the total weight of the cables plus hangers isn't that far from the helicopter's lift capability. Clear and calm conditions are absolutely essential. The ground crew on this side of the gorge have to repeat the catching and fixing operation. But thankfully, all goes well. The next part of the operation involves lifting the cables onto the top of the towers using the helicopter. We've compressed the action. It's not as easy as this makes it look. Some cables took well over five minutes to position properly. But five minutes of helicopter time is replacing days, if not weeks, of work to do this manually. On the far side of the gorge, once again, the view is obscured by the trees. On the near side of the gorge, the view is clearer, but with all the cable off the ground, now there is additional strain on the cable. The saddle, built into the metal cap, is only just wide enough for the cable. 
we're talking just a few millimetres here. Talk about precision flying. After this part of the operation, it's beginning to look like a suspension bridge. But there are even more tricky operations to come. The two timber struts sticking out from either side of this man cage give this operation a new twist. Man cages slung under helicopters have been used by workers on power transmission lines for some years. The struts on this man cage are designed to span the distance between the two suspension cables. This will allow the pilot to drop the cage onto the cables, so the men in the cage can then lean out and adjust the clips holding the hangers. The pilot has got an observer to help, but this is not going to be an easy ride. Attaching the hangers to the suspension cables as they lay on the ground was bound to cause problems when the cables were lifted and straightened out. And when they were lifted up onto the towers, the added tension caused the twisting built into the cables to come into play. But even this wasn't the trickiest bit. They then had to fly in and fix the longer, heavier hangers. The pilot has been precision flying for several hours now. But dropping the swaying hangers below the cage into the gap between the suspension cables is going to require yet more intense concentration. Fortunately, the weather is staying fine. And especially, the wind is holding off. The fear here is dropping anything. Hangers, bolts or tools. The closer to the towers they get, the longer and the heavier the hangers become.
Another difficulty is that the closer they get to the towers, the greater the angle of the suspension cables. So holding the cage steady gets even more difficult. And then it's back to terra firma. If that's what you can call a moving set of loose planks over a 55 metre drop to the riverbed below. At just over 140 metres long, the Mara Mataha Bridge will be the second longest suspension bridge in New Zealand. Only a few weeks later, the job's done. And there's a formal ceremony to open the bridge. First, there are blessings and speeches by local iwi, welcoming the guests. Piripi Crown was a local forestry worker who had suffered an accident. He was truly delighted to be one of the first across. Several contractors came. Word had spread about this remarkable feat of engineering. Also, local people came who had been wondering what had been going on in their neighbourhood for the last two years. So now, the timber trail is nearly ready for its public. Guarding the northern entrance of the trail stands a pole, a representation of the chieftain Te Kanawa, who, the story goes, challenged fellow chieftain Tutitafa to a race that largely followed the route of the trail from north to south. Here stand massive trees. Rimu, Matai, Kahikatea and Tortora. Such trees were, of course, green gold to a new and developing nation. They were irresistible to the loggers. That any remain here is down to a remarkable man, Stephen King, and his supporters. In 1978, they climbed trees here and refused to come down when the loggers approached with their chainsaws and bulldozers. They were the first people in the world to use this dramatic way to protest the milling of native forests. By the 1970s, replacing natives with plantation radiata pine was the way to go, and Puriora was established as a village of forest workers dedicated to this task. Huge areas of forest were cleared. But the amazing and encouraging thing is how, given time, the bush is so capable of regenerating itself. Under the canopy of the forest reserve, there are a few relics left from the forestry era. This little gem is a two-ton caterpillar tractor from 1925. 
It was abandoned in the bush in 1940. And this was a steam-driven log hauler used by forestry workers to haul logs from the bush before the introduction of bulldozers. But it is the variety of different landscapes that will appeal to the users of the trail. Long stretches of trail through shady bush and through deep cuttings made for the tramway will keep travellers cool in the heat of summer. Elsewhere, the track opens out to wider views of the landscape. But it isn't just the landscapes that will appeal to the cyclists. <laughs> 